Um, so welcome uh, on this beautiful day here in Vienna. Uh, spring has started um, and um, I, I hope you, you will enjoy this. Um, so I would like to tell you a bit about uh, fluorescent activated nuclear sorting or um, short funds. Um, so I, I, I want to start with a, a short disclaimer. So we are just humble users of this technique. Um, we did not develop it. Um, of course, it, it has been used before, um, but we, we really uh, used it um, to, to look at a very specific, very rare cell type. Um, also, um, I'm, uh, we have at our institute, so I'm at the Gregor Mendel Institute in Vienna and a group of Autron Mittelsteinscheid. Um, so we have the great luxury to have a great fax facility. Um, and I'm, I'm not a fax technician myself. So if you have very detailed questions, you know, about certain settings or uh, compensation or uh, the software, um, I can certainly forward those to, to some of our extremely competent technicians. Um, but of course, I, I will try and, and help you. Um, okay, let's start. So um, this is the overview uh, of my presentation. So I would like to give you a brief history of fax and funds. Um, and, and then I will uh, go into detail how we apply this technique um, and the protocol that, that we have developed. So um, let's look straight into the heart of uh, flow cytometer. And so that is what you see. Um, so this is the flow cell. And you can think of uh, flow cytometry really as a, a stream of uh, rivers. So you have a big river here with a sheet fluid um, that is under pressure. And it flows here with a lamina flow. And you have this uh, small river with uh, contains all the particles of interest. And this is uh, injected into this big river. And that um, will result in uh, speeding up of the flow and separation of the particles um, that uh, ride here on this small river. So this is called uh, hydrodynamic focusing. And it results really that you align your particles in the center of the flow stream um, and you can separate them. And that allows you to, to have the single particles then phenotyped by a laser light source and um, of course, you can measure many different parameters. You can just measure the scattering of your particle. Uh, and you can, of course, also measure fluorescent intensities. Um, so it's um, really the, the first single cell method um, that was suitable for high throughput. It's possible to collect uh, multiple phenotypic variables. So in the modern flow cytometers, uh, more than 20 uh, different parameters. And the uh, two advantages that make this really so great is the large number of particles uh, that is possible to be evaluated. Um, so that's up to 100,000 um, per second. And the possibility to actually separate those particles and, and sort them. So you can think of um, a flow cytometer uh, as, a, as a high throughput phenotyping device for cellular and subcellular particles, basically. So um, a brief history. Um, so it uh, started, of course, um, we are all standing of, uh, on the shoulders of giants. Um, and there's only a few names here uh, that I wrote out, uh, some of the most important ones. Um, of course, there's probably many more names that uh, made in important contributions. Um, so it starts as early as in the late 19th hundred century. Um, when uh, this gentleman here, Lord Relay, um, you might know him from the Relay number, which is an important property of uh, fluids. And he discovered uh, the droplet formation um, of fluids that um, stream out of an aperture. Uh, he later also actually got the Nobel Prize for his work on, um, on gases. And then uh, in the 30s, um, this guy uh, called Moldovan, he had to, for the very first time uh, the idea to use a uh, cell suspension stream um, for, for counting. So that was a very simple device. It was actually published here in, um, in Science at the time. And um, so it's basically just uh, a stream of particles through a very thin capillary 
um, and that can be observed with a microscope. Um, of course, the trouble is that if you have a very thin capillary, it might block very fast. If you widen the capillary, it's very difficult to get single particles flowing through. And that was really then solved, this problem, um, by Crossland Taylor in the 50s. And he had uh, the insight to use this laminar flow device, which looks basically already like a modern flow cell, where you have this sheath fluid here coming from the side and the injection of uh, the flow of your particles of interest. That is from a paper in Nature, actually, at the time. And then um, in the 60s, we um, there was the development of the sorting. Um, so Sweet and Pulweiler, um, they they realized that um, these these stream they break into particles and they can be charged and this can be directed, which is basically the same principle that is used in inkjet printing. And they also use that for uh, so sorting of these particles. And then a German guy, Goethe, he, he for the first time used um, fluorescence absorbance um, to characterize these particles in the flow cytometer. And that was also the first commercial flow cytometer and uh, developed by Partec uh, in the end of the 60s. And then in the 70s, um, we have um, uh, Herzensberg. He um, made, um, he actually coined the term bucks of fluorescent activated cellular sorting, which is still a term owned actually by BD, Beckton Dickinson. And um, they are still uh, making uh, some of the best machines to this day. So in plant research, of course, people realized the strength of this technique. Um, it was a bit delayed. The trouble with plants is, of course, that plants have cell wall. That is, uh, so the plant cells are difficult to get into solution, which is necessary for flow cytometry. They also have irregular shape that can disturb the lamina flow. Often plants have secondary metabolites uh, with high autoresistance. And you can avoid some of these problems by protoplasting but then protoplasts also have uh, problems on their own so they are difficult to prepare um, you really need to find the best conditions for each different plant and plant tissue and they are quite fragile so it was used for the first time by uh, Heller in the 70s so he used the digestion uh, enzymatic digest to evaluate the uh, DNA content in roots of beans and then the revolutionary innovation of David Galbraith in 1983, uh, instead of using enzymes to use a razor blade, um, that really opened up the field uh, for many more applications. And that was actually also published in science at the time, in the 80s. And uh, this is just a few applications uh, that, that are uh, using um, flow cytometry and implant research nowadays, of course, for the separation of cells, uh, also for the estimation of nuclear DNA content, ploidy and unemployed. Uh, you can actually also use it to measure uh, secondary uh, metabolites uh, that have a high autofluorescence. Um, and you can actually even go as far so um, to 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 sort mitotic chromosomes. So one of the leaders and the spear heaters in this field is uh, Jaroslav Dolishal. Uh, he and his group in Olomouc, they really can manage to, to sort single individu individual metaphase chromosomes. And that is very powerful also um, to sequence complex and big genomes such as barley and wheat. And if you want to get more into uh, the application of flow cytometry in plants. I would also like to refer you to this book, which was uh, edited by Jaroslav Dolezal um, uh, and co-workers, and there uh, it's, uh, it should cover more or less the applications nowadays. Of course, there is also new developments. So something that I find very exciting are these AMNIS imaging flow cytometers. So instead of just measuring uh, fluorescence, or light intensities in the detector, 
they can take actual high resolution images of the particles that pass by and they can do so um, for 12 pictures per event in 10 different channels um, for 5,000 events per second. And that, of course, takes this phenotyping idea to a whole different level and will open up great possibilities. So, so far, I think you cannot sort with these machines, but it's probably only a question of time. And then I believe a lot of single cell applications uh, will follow. Uh, this has been used also already in plants. Uh, so Susanne Dunker from the Helmholtz Center in Germany, she um, used these uh, machines, uh, for example, in combination with deep learning so, um, for pollen identification um, and also for uh, speciation of algae, of um, microscopic algae. But let's step uh, back for a, a moment. Um, so why do we think uh, that fluorescent activated nuclear sorting is so great for the purpose we for for our for us for our um, usage? So we were really interested in isolating stem cells um, because we believe they uh, really hold the key for understanding epigenetic inheritance uh, or not inheritance or resetting. Um, from one generation to the next. Um, so we really wanted to start uh, isolating these cell uh, populations and starting to characterize them on a molecular level. And then, of course, you have different choices that you can take. You can just do the manual dissection, which is probably not very accurate. You can use laser capture and micro dissection, uh, which has a very high accuracy, um, but it, it's very timely and it's very difficult to get a lot of material. You can use uh, protoplasting and fluorescent activated cellular sorting, which has a very high accuracy, very high sensitivity. Um, but you need to do the protoplasting, um, which might uh, not be the best option for many applications. So it is known, for example, that the chromatin changes really rapidly in protoplasts. And of course, um, the mRNA levels as well. Um, so you need to be aware of the changes that are induced during the protoplasting procedure. And depending on what you want to do, this is also marker dependent. Um, another method is intact. So that's basically a method to affinity tag uh, nuclei. Uh, in principle, you could also affinity tag other things, um, for example, ribosomes that also has been done. Um, uh, of course, if you are interested in chromatin, you, you need a nuclei. Um, and uh, but that is uh, as a biochemical method uh, could also lead to problems if your cells of interest are of a very small amount compared to to the rest. So we really wanted to combine the ease of nuclear isolation um, with the high accuracy and stringency of fluorescent activated sorting and do this fluorescent activated nuclear sorting. Um, so yeah, we also, um, so this is the system uh, that we used most so far. So we use a uh, H2B M. Sherry reporter that is driven by the Clavata free promoter, which is a stem cell reporter. And you can see the expression of this reporter at the tip of the dome of the shoot apical meristem. And when I uh, show examples uh, during the presentation, it will be most likely from, from this construct. So um, let's have first a quick overview of the actual protocol. Um, so it's also, in principle, a very easy protocol. Mm. Uh, Stephanie Rosa. Um, I think two weeks ago, she said that single um, molecule in situ hybridization is uh, embarrassingly um, easy. I think this is probably even more embarrassingly easy. Um, the, 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 the outline is really you, you have some uh, plant, uh, plant material, uh, you do the mechanical homogenization, you go through a series of uh, filtering and wash steps, and then you can perform the 
puns. Um, you might also evaluate the quality of your nuclei, and then you can do all kinds of downstream applications with the material that you collected. Um, so as with everything, ah yeah, so uh, I forgot we we also um, put this together as a, a technical protocol. Um, so you are welcome to look up some details, uh, of course. And in case you do not have access, um, please don't hesitate to, to ask us and, and we can send you the protocol, of course. So um, it all starts with the plant material. And um, I mean, as with every any other experiment, of course, the most important thing that you need to be aware of is which assay you are actually planning to do. And that will inform you about all the necessary steps that you need to perform. Um, that will uh, inform you which fluorophores you uh, would like to take. Um, so this uh, website I can recommend if you want to check out different options. So is staining um, enough, uh, DAPI staining or cyber green staining, um, or do you need a reporter with a fluorescent protein? If so, which kind of fluorescent protein? Um, and if you want to have different combinations, um, you of course need to be aware of uh, the uh, emission spectra. Um, so for funds, what uh, we usually recommend is to have a histone fusion um, so that you have your protein really um, well attached to chromatin. In our hands, we I, I was not able to get good purified sorted nuclei uh, when just using a nuclear localization signal. Um, it seems that the nuclei lose fluorescent intensity rather quick after you start with the nuclear extraction. And um, so we would, I, and this is even the case for big nuclear fusion proteins, we even have observed that. So I would strongly recommend a histone fusion if you uh, need only one uh, histone H2B is well established to do to do a good job. Um, and yeah, of course, what is your desired cell type? What is the developmental stage uh, you want to look at uh, or treatment? Um, all of this is good to to check out in small experiments before you start a big experiment um, to really see how how the efficiency of the sorting works. We, for example, now realize that uh, heat treatment makes sorting terrible and very difficult. Um, so that is something we uh, did not expect. Um, the reason is probably because uh, heat shock plants, they accumulate a lot of starch granules and uh, this increases the, the density of particles in the suspension immensely and then the whole sorting becomes very difficult. Um, also what is the desired number of nuclei? Um, for RNA you might get away with a few hundred, um, even of course uh, you might think about a single uh, RNA, a single nuclei RNA sequencing experiment which is um, seems to be feasible. Um, for other applications, you might need more. So for DNA extraction and biosified library preparation, we usually use at least a few thousand. Um, the more usually the better, of course. Um, so what is the ratio of your target nuclei and how many nuclei are in the samples? Um, maybe you need to do an enrichment. Uh, of the tissue. So because we are interested in stem cells, we really need to do an enrichment, uh, mechanical enrichment um, for many applications. So that is uh, cutting out by hand uh, the meristems um, to get the ratio uh, right and to make the sorting feasible. Um, and also what is the size of the nuclei? Of course, is it tiny meristematic nuclei or are you interested in big nuclei from trichomes, for example. So all doing the sorting is really a compromise of uh, yield, the purity you can get from your isolates and the sorting time and collection time. Um, so this is what you always need to keep in mind. And it's worth to spend a bit of time 
uh, doing some small experiments to get this right before scaling it up. So then the buffers, um, we tried many different buffers and at least in our hands, uh, the good old Galbraith buffer from the 80s seems to be still the best option. Um, this is the recipe here. Uh, we now add also um, protease inhibitors. Um, this complete ultra from Roche um, seem to be the most efficient ones. We also add the detergent. So 0.1% Triton um, seems to be working well. Um, we also tried uh, different concentrations. Um, so if you have lower concentrations, the yield will go down automatically. You will get much less release of nuclei. At 0.1% triton, um, it's actually already lysing the cells. It penetrates tissue and you need to be aware of that uh, as well. Um, so you probably will start getting degradation as soon as you have this in your buffer. Um, and we also add a bit of uh, beta macapta ethanol and then a ribolock. This uh, seems trivial, but it was really um, a change, a game changer for us because in, in initially we didn't really use ribolock when we collected the material, um, but only during the homogenization process. Um, just to, to, to save because it's, it's not very cheap. That was a big mistake. So here you can see that this really um, minus rubber lock, that's really the RNA quality that you get um, from this capillary electrophoresis. Um, with rubber lock, it usually looks better. This is actually one of the worst examples. Um, so it's really important to add this at the concentration from one unit per microliter from the beginning on of your experiment. And then the staining buffer in which we perform the washing and, and the sorting, this is basically the same, plus uh, DAPI added. So um, the way you do the homogenization um, also is informed by how many nuclei you need. So if you really want to have beautiful DAPI peaks as here on the upper panel, um, we really can reproducibly achieve this only by using the good old razor blades and in particular the Wilkinson SWAT classic double-sided. Uh, we test different um, models so these are really the best. Um, However, the yield of your nuclei will be very, very low. Um, so you might get away also with birth profiles. Um, this is when we use a tissue ruptor. This is um, from Kiergen. Um, and that has the advantage that it has uh, disposable probes. Um, so you can work very clean. And, um, but it's very hard to get really beautiful DAPI separating peaks uh, with that. And um, but since you sought then for another fluorophore additionally to, to DAPI, uh, this might not be so tragic. And if you're interested in bulk sequencing, um, then this might be actually good enough. And then you um, go through um, wash steps. So we, uh, we usually wash the nuclear fraction once in the wash buffer, which is the same buffer uh, as the Galbraith buffer. And then we resuspend the pellet uh, in the staining buffer. And we have to filter it one more time. Um, we use these uh, cell tricks, 30 micrometer nylon filters, and you filter it directly into the sorting tubes. Um, also important for the whole experiment, um, at least from the collection stage on, is to use really uh, low binding tubes. Uh, that is, if you have a low amount of material, if you have uh, a lot of nuclei, um, so many ten thousands, of course, this might not be necessary. And um, then, of course, you need to think about the collection buffer that you use. Um, so for RNA, the best seems to be really to directly sort into a trisole. And for DNA, we use uh, uh, lysis buffers. Um, 
but of course, if you, it depends on your application really. So let me take you through one uh, example of our fax. Um, so to, to, to show you a bit the gating strategy uh, that we used. So we really uh, set your different gates uh, up to the Mcherry gate. And here you can see the gates P1 and P2. So these are all the events here on the forward scatter and the side scatter. Um, so these are just um, measuring the scattering of the light of your objects. So the forward scatter is um, roughly um, proportional, uh, correlates with the size of your object and the side scatter with the granularity and the structure of your object. Um, and then in this P2 gate, which shows the forward scatter width over forward scatter area. Um, and here you can really exclude uh, duplices and um, droplets that contain several um, particles. And then next would come the DAPI gates. Um, so here we have the DAPI width on the DAPI area. And you can already see here some populations. Um, of single DAPI events. And when you zoom in here in this P, gate P3 and you um, plot this as the DAPI area on the number of counts, you see nicely these uh, DAPI peaks that represent, of course, the 2C and 4C and end replicated stages of your nuclei. Then the final step is, in our case, with this uh, reporter, the Sherry gate. Um, you can see here this population of cells, which is uh, in this gate. And these populations, you should not find them in the wild type control. So it's always uh, also necessary to do a wild type in parallel. So the gates will shift from experiment to experiment. So you always want to adjust the gate perfectly and at each experiment. And we usually try to set the gate in a way that we have less than 1% um, in the wild type gate. Um, sometimes you just have these these things like, like this dot here. Um, and then if you close the gate too much, you of course will lose too many events. But I think 1% is a good compromise. So after funds, um, of course, it again depends on your application. So um, we have now done several times bisovite sequencing and uh, mRNA sequencing. So for DNA, I would strongly recommend this kit here from Simo, this quick DNA micro prep kit. Um, if you have more than 10,000 nuclei, you uh, might also try a normal CTAP protocol, um, which also can work then very efficiently. Um, but this kit um, performs uh, much better than um, I, I tried. I compared this here in this instance with a um, magnetic bead isolation method. And this kit uh, was actually much, much better and is very easy to use. Then you, of course, need to quantify the the DNA that you isolated. So we use a pico green assay um, from Thermo uh, in combination with a fluorescent nanodrop. Um, so you really should use a fluorescing method. So with uh, the normal nanodrop uh, looking at 260 to 80, 280 ratios, this is just too inaccurate. And and then for the bisophyte library preparation, we used another kit from Simo which is called the Picomethyl Seq Library Kit, which is um, really the best kit, seems to be for low amounts of DNA, so one nanogram or even less. Um, for the RNA, um, the Trisol, we use Trisol LS, which is slightly higher concentrated, um, uh, works, works uh, the best in our hand. Um, I've, I also tried different methods here as uh, the comparison with this direct soul, which is uh, from Simo as well, and that combines the trisol with the column purification. 
um, but in our hands, the normal drysable precipitation method is, is works really um, the best. And then if you have only a few thousand nuclei or less, you really need to quantify your RNA amount with this uh, PICO chip from Agiland. Um, that seems to be the most sensitive method, even more sensitive than um, high sensitive runs on a fragment analyzer. Um, so you can reliably detect a few hundred picogram per microliter. And these are um, showing here just the, the traces um, of some of our results. So you might then want to make sure that you actually have an enrichment of your tissue of interest. Um, we did this by qPCR. Um, a very nice uh, qPCR um, set was offered by Roche, which offered a um, probe set um, in combination with a, with a really good algorithm to calculate the primers. Unfortunately, they are out of production at this time, but you might still contact them and ask for the sequence of the probes um, if you have um, a particular assay in mind. And if you are not successful with the other probes. Um, so cyber green is really not that great if you have only tiny amounts of material in our experience. And um, what we also made sure is, um, this has been shown for the intact method already, um, we wanted to, to see this again. So these are just star sort of nuclei. Um, the comparison of um, total RNA with nuclear RNA. And as you can see, there's very high correlation, um, not only for genes, but also for transposable elements. Um, so, of course, if you are interested in some particular uh, nuclear RNAs or um, particular RNAs that are um, transported to P-bodies or so, that, that might be different. However, in general, we believe that the mRNA pool in the nucleus is better representing the total RNA pool. Um, just a few notes on uh, plant material. Um, so here um, we tested different treatments on um, four and eight day old seedlings. Um, so these are two different replicates and here you can see the fresh tissue. Um, so these are the DAPI profiles. Um, you can see frozen tissue and um, here we fix the nuclei. So after the first um, nuclei filtering step, we added the form aldehyde. And this here is the fixed tissue, also fixed with form aldehyde for 10 minutes each. Um, so first of all, you can see that different treatments, of course, um, make a difference for how beautiful you can separate the nuclei. Um, but also different developmental stages uh, react quite different. So at eight days after germination, uh, the profiles still looked quite nice in the fixed material, um, but in young seedlings, probably because everything is more compact and there's more small cells, um, we see a much a bigger influence on these treatments. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can throw away this fixed tissue. Um, so um, we actually performed a um, uh, chip experiment to chromatin IPs and we realized that we can actually only use the fixed tissue, um, that we cannot see any specific enrichment when we fixed only the nuclei at the isolated nuclear stage. So the effect in freezing and fixing uh, might totally depend on the tissue type. I should also add, so for RNA isolation, I would always recommend to use only fresh tissue. Um, we could not get good quality RNA from other uh, treated material. Um, so a few notes on the data analysis, um, maybe to, to save you a bit of a headache. Um, so we did uh, bisulfide sequencing and mRNA-seq. So for the bisulfide sequencing, 
it's usually it's rare that you get um, more than 50% of your reads um, mappable. Um, but for the SIMO kit, it's probably a bit worse. Um, so I had probably around 40% of the reads mapping to the Arabidopsis genome. Um, but what I did realize that when you trim away um, pieces of your reads, um, what you usually do to, to get rid of low quality bases or uh, and remaining adaptives, I could see a gradual increase in the mapping efficiency. Um, and that then was actually also, I found this described in this block here, sequencing QC fails by Felix Krüger, who is one of the co-authors of Bismarck, which is a mapper for bisulfite converted DNA. Um, and he also described the very same thing with exactly this kit. And uh, his explanation is that what happens during library amplification is that you get a big proportion of chimeric reads. So uh, one end is basically from one part of the genome and the other end from another part of the genome. And that's why you cannot um, map paired end reads. So this is for paired end reads. And there is a mitigation strategy that you can do. So you can first map the paired reads, you read out the unmapped reads, you split um, those reads, and then you map separately the, the forward and the reverse read. And then you merge everything again. Um, of course, this is a bit uh, much more laborious. So I would simply recommend to use your sequencing space on single reads, and you will have better mapping efficiency from the beginning, and um, you save a lot of work, uh, the downstream analysis. Um, for the mRNA, um, we also uh, weren't so sure, because of course you would like to get the information of the strandedness, and you might not want to depend on uh, poly A tails, which is used by the SmartSeq method. So we also tested the TrueSeq. Um, the disadvantage is that you really need much more material for TrueSeq. And um, so we, we tested that and we um, went through the pain to try to collect enough material for the TrueSeq. So we had uh, 10 times as much uh, material. So around 20 nanogram of input um, compared to the smart seek, which was only around uh, one to two nanogram. Um, but it turns out that the libraries were still much less complex in the true seek method. So especially for genes which are not very highly abundant. So if you um, map those um, against the number of genes, um, so for example, here we have around um, 5,000 genes with 100 counts. Um, sorry, 500 genes with 100 counts in the SmartSeq, um, but they are not represented in the uh, TrueSeq uh, protocol. So I would always recommend uh, SmartSeq um, for this very low abundant, um, you have very small amounts of input. Um, now there's also the SmartSeq pre version, um, which uh, allows the incorporation of uh, Yumi's. Um, so we have not tested those this yet. Um, but uh, this is certainly very interesting as well. Um, and that gets me uh, to the summary. So um, FUNS is really allowing you to get omics data of uh, very rare cell types as well. Um, so that is, of course, the power of the method. And um, it is actually a really easy method, um, but you need to invest uh, a bit of time and experimentation uh, in the beginning um, before you scale it up um, to make sure um, you, you get the results that you want. Um, so I would like to acknowledge, of course, the, the people in our lab. Um, so uh, we have a wonderful group here at the Gregor Mendel Institute. Um, we have uh, wonderful collaborations and um, we have amazing facilities that of course uh, allow a lot of experimentation um, that would not be possible. Um, so we have the bioptics facility with um, the, all the fax machines 
and extremely competent people and we have uh, a very um, competent next generation sequencing facility as well um, so i hope uh, that was helpful for some of you and i'm happy to for some discussions um, yeah that's great thank you very much ruben that was super detailed there and you gave a lot of little uh, little tips um so uh, i'm going to ask people if you have any questions please send them send them through and uh, and we will answer, answer them uh, ask them so let me let me kick off though so i mean you uh, like stephanie as you said you know this is an easy protocol if you know what you're doing um and, and you you mentioned a lot of parameters that you tested um to get the you know to get the protocol to the stage where you were happy with it so but you were using a very you know precise um tissue type so how much tissue were you needing to test each time were you testing on a whole seedling or do you did you test specifically on that small tissue type each time you wanted to test frozen or fixed or fixed nuclei or these different things what was the scale of the testing that you did before you did before you scaled up um well usually you would um start um so if you have um particular treatment in mind for example that you want to, to test um, with a particular cell type, um, of course, it's easier to, to first test with uh, just normal DAPI stain nuclei, um, how the sorting works, um, what you can expect, uh, what is the ratio of total events to a number of DAPI events. And once that works nicely, um, then you can start looking into your tissue of interest, which is usually probably much less nuclei, much less events, but you have established the sorting and and now it's basically uh, once you understand what the ratio is then of your nuclei of interest to the total number of nuclei um, um, then you can scale up accordingly um, to, to the desired number of, of events that you need no. so um, yeah i mean you can i mean if you are interested in seedlings for example you can do a small experiment with a few seedlings mm -hmm. um, see if that works and then it's easy to scale up seedlings. Um, yeah. yeah, that's true. Okay, um, okay. So a couple of questions. So uh, Abdella Abdella asks if you if you've tried using um, fans for proteomic analysis of your samples. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we have not. We have not tried that um, yet. It might be, of course, very interesting to also do some proteomics on this um the only um i mean as i mentioned already what we do see indeed is that um many nuclear proteins seem to leave the nucleus um once you start with the isolation um so there you might want to play also with uh, various fixing methods to be sure um you you still have the whole complexity of of the nucleus um, mm -hmm. Why that is, we are not entirely sure. Um, it could certainly be true that um, you know some nuclei get damaged, um, that there's some nuclei have holes, and the whole nuclear plasm is basically mm -hmm. released. Um, but for mRNA, we don't really see that. Um, we see it still contained well in the nucleus. Um, so it's probably not just that the nuclei are damaged. It's probably also that the import export machinery is out of balance and then um, many nuclear proteins are exported out mm -hmm. of the nucleus quickly mm -hmm. that's yeah, what okay. i so, suspect yeah. mm -hmm. so a question from uh, sunil sunil sorry so, uh, and they ask um thanks for the well they say thanks for the detailed presentation i agree um and they ask if you've won wondering if you've used liquid nitrogen ground tissues in your in your samples Yes, um, so we use that um, for um, for experimenting with uh, attack seek and chip chromatin IP. Um, um, so there you it seems to be the case that you can really um, fix the tissue, freeze it in liquid nitrogen, grind it, and you, we got very good results. Um, for RNA seq, um, this did not work out well, and I would not recommend that to do that. Um, okay. Biosified seek we actually haven't tested because we usually 
um, try to do that in parallel with the RNA isolation. Um, so I cannot comment on whether you can freeze uh, and then fuck sort and get good DNA, but I guess it, I don't see a reason why not, actually. Okay. Mm. So a uh, question from uh, Peter Kapel, and he asks, any idea why the formaldehyde fixed results, uh, sorry, why the formaldehyde fixation results in worst DAPI histograms? He says they have exactly the opposite experience. However, they use a different buffer and don't extract RNAs. Um, well, I mean, naively, I would have just thought that, um, you know, if you, of course, start fixing the tissue and um, that that it's harder to to separate nuclei from each other and it's also harder to release the nuclei from the cell. Um, so that was just my naive explanation. Maybe there's more to it. Um, I'm, 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 I don't know. Um, yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is this is one of the intriguing, uh, intriguing parts for me when you know, when looking through the protocol. This uh, the uh, the differences between fixed and frozen tissues. Intuitively, you think you really need to fix something in order to get the best samples, but you you know you, what you said that's not that's not what you found. So, yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, question from uh, uh, Dongdu. Uh, and they ask, do you think fixed samples are better than fresh samples for chip seq? And have you tried for single nucleus seq? And do you think any modification will be necessary for that? Um, yes, for chip seq, definitely we 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 tried that. Um, it, for us, it worked only with fixed material actually, um, and um, it did not work with unfixed material which is actually the normal chip protocol anyway, um, at least the old traditional chip protocol. Um, as for single cell, so um, we also um, want to um, go into that direction of single nuclei sequencing, but that is mRNA sequencing. So that seems to work actually uh, quite well. We already have some results there. Mm -hmm. um, the beauty of, of doing a single um, nuclear sequencing is, of course, that you can if you do that in a plate format um, in combination with PANS. You can actually record the phenotype of each nucleus that you sort in a particular well. And then if mm -hmm. you do the smart seq, you have the expression data in combination with the phenotypic data, which is, of course, um, beautiful. Um, so for single nuclei chip, um i i i have no idea um i we i haven't given that much thought because i thought it's, uh, it's too too far away anyway um mm -hmm. i i cannot really comment on how much you would have to change the protocol um i mean there's these uh, you know cut and run and cut and tech now which uh, really seem to be working well with tiny amounts of material and that is probably the way to go then also for single nuclei. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a, a question from uh, Aline, Aline Potts, and she she asked something which is kind of follows on from what you just said. So she asked whether you've tried to score different parameters of the of your different stem cells, like for example, nuclear size, um, simultaneously with your sorting. And can you also deduce um, different changes in uh, chromatin organization from your sorted nuclear? Um, no, that is not really possible, I think, with the way we do the sorting. I think that's really too inaccurate. Um, of course, now I'm thinking about um, uh, imaging glow cytometry, which mm -hmm. would allow uh, exactly these kind of things. Um, I mean, it's just Looking at the DAPI profiles of stem cells, it seems that on average they are more G1 cells um, compared to other meristematic cells. Um, but um, looking at uh, chromatin and uh, the exact size, because they do not vary so much in size, the nuclei, um, so they are all between five and eight uh, micrometers, maybe across. Um, and you 
cannot really distinguish that with the forward and side scatters, um, I believe. So um, we do these um, with, uh, with a microscope. Um, we address these kind of questions um, with a microscope. Yeah. And is that so? You oh. mentioned you you mentioned a moment ago about your single nuclei and looking at the phenotypes. So is that the sort of phenotypes you're looking at? Just the the gross kind of morphology of those single nuclei that you're putting into the plates? Right. So I mean, the readouts that you have is basically the DAPI intensities, which tells you the cell cycle state of the nucleus, yeah. and in our case, the M Jerry, um, okay. which is maybe also a proxy of the size, but the uh, um, the DAPI and the MCHERI together um, tell you that we are at least probably have nucleus with more DNA, which is probably a bit, bit bigger now. Okay. 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 So um, I think that's the end of the questions, actually. So we had some good detailed questions there. Oh, hang on. Here we go. Uh, we got one more. Um, one more just come in from Ahmet Tech. Uh, and he says, thanks for the detailed explanation. Um, Let's have a look. So, can you um, mention about fans and um, methylation properties at the whole genome or fractions of a genome? Yeah. So, can you can you look at the parts of the genome differences, or are you looking at the whole genome differences? Yeah. Um, sorry, I don't really understand that. Um, you mean with bisulfide sequencing? Yes. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, we we um, we really we do a whole genome bisulfide sequencing, so you basically look at the whole genome, and then it depends on the coverage that you have, um, how detailed you can look at certain regions in the genome. So if you have an average coverage of uh, of ten or fifteen, um, it should allow you to to look at most regions. Um, of course, some remain dark, and you need a very high coverage to to actually see. Um, you know, to get closer to the centromeres. Um, mm -hmm. well, and is, yeah. so, is it really a simply simple a simple equation that you you sort more than you can get better like bisulfide sequencing data, basically? Um, yes, I mean there is a certain threshold. So, um, with less than one nanogram of DNA, the so one nanogram um, we get from about um, four or five thousand nuclei. You can get one nanogram of DNA. Um, so with less, um, we have more um, failures in library construction. So we we also did libraries with less material, um, like with five six hundred picograms. Um, but then usually, um, you know, one one out of three libraries was not really useful, um, and that ratio goes goes up the lower you go. Um, so uh, from one nanogram on, we had more reliably good libraries, I would say. Um, okay. But more is probably also not really needed. Um, so libraries look really good for a nanogram. If you get a few nanograms, yeah, probably better to have a backup in the freezer <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, so um, so we got maybe a final question then. So this is about kind of scaling up, I think. So scaling up the number of samples. So you, you know, when you're doing this, you're doing a, a relatively small number of samples. So Nazanin asks whether you can adapt, and do you think you can adapt the nuclear extraction for, for lots of samples? So like hundreds of samples potentially, or do you think you'll just get a lack of quality if you, if you tried to do that? Um, well, it depends really uh, on on your sample type. Um, how, of course, if you need to enrich mechanically um, and you need to collect thousands of plants, and it will get difficult to collect hundreds yeah. of samples. But if 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 you know you're interested in stomata and from leaves, um, it might be really easy and straightforward to get a lot of samples. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it wasn't really never um, we never really tried to scale this up to um, paralyze this uh, a lot, um, but mm. it, it depends really on your tissue type, I guess, how easy that will be. That's true. So uh, give us an idea. So you mentioned so one nanogram, um, you get that from four or five thousand um, nuclei, and how so how many how many nuclei do you get from from a single um, 
Shudebu Gomera stem, how many dissections do you need to do for that? Yeah, so um, you probably get around one nucleus. Uh, so if you look at young seedlings, um, so which are like seven day old, um, they have around 40 stem cells or so, um, mm -hmm. but we get around one one nucleus. Wow. Oh, okay. I agree. I it varies. Um, okay. And I mean, it also depends a bit on the um, on the fax settings. Um, I mean, you have different settings there. You have settings for yield and for purity and for the single cell settings. And um, so yield basically sorts everything that contains um, one of your particles of interest. And the purity settings would be that um, you do not take those that contain additional particles that you're not interested in. Um, and then the, you have the single cell settings uh, that look at the three, three different particles and only take your particle you're interested in if the if the droplets before and after are empty and your uh, particles in the middle droplet is in the middle. So that means you will lose a lot of uh, events you're interested in. Um, um, so it also really depends on the settings um, that you take, um, how how efficient um, you get back the nuclei you're interested in. Mm -hmm. no. uh, but I think we can say from from these experiments, it was a a painful number of of uh, apical marrow stems that you had to uh, uh, to mm -hmm. dissect. There. Yeah. So so Nazanin just comes back from the previous question, and she's saying she was talking about a Rhabdopsis leave. So so maybe it could be possible to scale up um, fraction when you're using tissues where you know you're going to have a lot of cells there. Hopefully. So uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. but, uh, Okay, so I think I think we'll leave it there. So it's been really great, fantastically detailed, um, Ruben. So and I'm sure you know your details are available online. If anyone has any other questions for you, I'm sure you'll be happy to to answer them if, if people think of them. 